Good morning, Central. Come on, good morning, Central. Good morning. I want to say good morning to everybody who is online. We, we can't hear you, but we know you are there. Everybody do me a favor, if we could, on the count of three, say good morning, Central Online. Y'all ready? Yes, we are ready. Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Good morning, Central Online. All right. Listen, before we get into this word, today, uh, the word is going to be maybe a little bit heavy, maybe a little bit convicting. It's going to be a lot of knowledge thrown at us. So I kind of want to break this up just a little bit right now because, you know, it might be a little tough in the word, but it's going to be all right. So let's do this. Take about 10 seconds, turn to your left, to your right, in front of you, behind you, find somebody who you didn't walk in here with and just say good morning to them. Uh Uh-huh. If you're online, talk to somebody in your house and say good morning. Amen. All right. All right, everybody spoke to somebody? Yes, all right. That, y'all feel good about that? I do. Amen. It's interesting, nobody said good morning to me, but that's okay. That's all, right. <laughs> all right, let's, let's get into the word uh, and, and we'll move. If you will, join me in the book of Acts, the second chapter, uh, is where we'll be today reading the first verse. Through the 13th verse, I am reading from the Christian Standard Bible, the CSB version, all right? Acts chapter 2, we're going to start at verses 1, and we'll read through verses 13, all right? So it says here, it says that when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and Judea and Cappadocia, uh, and parts of Libya near Syria, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the magnificent acts of God in our own tongues. They were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Verse 13 says, but some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. The word of the Lord is already blessed. So before we we get into this, I, I want to let you know what I have titled today's service or sermon, uh, which is Pentecost Sunday, one spirit, one body, one church. Pentecost Sunday, one spirit, one body, one church. So in case you didn't know that today is the day of Pentecost, or as we consider Pentecost Sunday, right? I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, uh, and this is, I kind of want you to participate with me here. By show of hands, how many people have ever heard of Pentecost Sunday, or the day of Pentecost. Okay, good. Here's my second question. How many people know enough about Pentecost Sunday or the day of Pentecost to effectively explain it to someone else? Raise your hands. Okay. A lot less hands, all right? Good. For those of us who raise our hands, I'm going to invite you up because you're going to preach with me today. Yeah, all right. That's funny. 
All right, so let, let's talk about what uh, Pentecost Sunday actually is, or this day of Pentecost, right? So what is Pentecost Sunday? I looked it up, and this is what a couple of people had to say. It says that Pentecost Sunday is a commemoration and celebration of the receiving of the Holy Spirit by the early church. It says that John the Baptist prophesied of the first Pentecost when Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we find this in the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 11, where it says, uh, John is speaking, it says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, in today's times, in in many Christian churches, Pentecost Sunday is celebrated to recognize the gift of the Holy Spirit, recognizing that God's very life, breath, and energy lives in us believers. This Pentecost Sunday is to remind us that we all have this unifying spirit that was poured out upon the first century church. That this was not something that just happened back then and does not no longer exist today. Amen. It is a reminder that we are co-heirs with Christ to suffer with him that we may also be glorified with him. That we are all baptized by one spirit into one body and that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us as believers. And if you're like me, that is exciting news. That the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, that did all of those things in the Bible that we read about, is still active and alive today and lives inside of us. So we're talking about this thing called the Holy Spirit. You hear in the scriptures about this day of Pentecost that this Holy Spirit fell and it was great. It was this crazy move and it was just rushing wind sound. And some of us might say, well, well, what is the Holy Spirit? Well, how do I know that the Holy Spirit has rested on me or that I've experienced the Holy Spirit? And we're going to look into this today. But I want to give you a personal story from my own life. I remember, since I can remember, probably in my mama's womb, I was going to church. Um, I grew up in church all my life. And I remember we were at one church, then we went to another church. And my mom went down to get saved. But we've been in church all our lives. We get to a new church and she goes down to get saved. She's crying and she's weeping and, and she takes us down. I was about six or seven and we go down with her, and she's crying, so it's emotional because my mom is crying. So I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do, but this is going to be great, right? We get down there. It's a big church, uh, and they take us into this back room, and it's like so mesmerizing and powerful, and they sit us down, and they're like, do you know God? And I was like, yeah. And then they said, do you believe he died for you? And I was like, yeah, I'm six. I don't know none of this, but it sounded like that was the right answer. And because I was given the right answer, the lady was getting excited. So I was excited. And she told me, she's like, well, if you believe that, then you're saved. And she decided, she hugged me. And I was like, ooh, I'm saved. <laughs> and I would go to church and I would tell, I mean, I would go to school and stuff like that, tell people, I would talk about Jesus. And I was in church all my life. And I'm saved. And I remember one prayer night, in a shut-in, a youth shut-in, I was about 13, we were praying, and I was reading my word and stuff like that because I was saved, because the lady told me I was saved, and I was reading my word, and I remember one night when we were praying in this shut-in, the Holy Spirit fell on me, 
And I began to cry and I began to weep and I didn't know why. But it felt like somebody was just hugging me and I felt safe and vulnerable at the same time. But I knew it wasn't my mom because it felt different. I I knew it wasn't my pastor because when I looked around, nobody was around. But I felt it. And then I realized I wasn't saved when I was six. I got saved at 13. And the evidence of me getting saved was that the Holy Spirit touched and rested on me. Because at 13, I knew enough to believe. Because you can't be saved without believing. Oh, man. Some, this, this is not in my notes. Some of us are in church and we think we're saved because somebody told us we're saved. But if you don't believe, you can't be saved. We're going to touch on it a little later. I told you it's going to be a little heavy. It's okay. But let's talk about this Holy Spirit. What is the significance of the Holy Spirit? Right? Some of you hear some people say the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. (laughs) What it is not is not nothing mystical. It's not a fairy tale. It's actually something very real. But the Holy Spirit is not a person. It is a spirit. But it is alive and it's real. Here's the significance. One, the Holy Spirit that we find out as you read your word, this Bible, not what man tells you, but when you really read for yourself, we find out that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And I'm not talking about at night I can't sleep because I'm scared and oh, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. No, no. But I'm talking about when you can't break habits that you're addicted to and you're going through trials and tribulation in your life, and your life seems like it's going to get the best of you, and you have no peace, the Holy Spirit comes in and comforts you. It doesn't eliminate your trials or your storms, but while you're going through it, it'll give you some comfort. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is our comforter. He is also our counselor. He, he, the Holy Spirit is the one that will start giving us and reminding us what the Lord has said when we're going through and facing life. And our Holy Spirit is also our seal. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 13 through 14, it says that in him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Verse 14 says the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is our seal that we are saying. Yes, sir. In other words, and once you really get into this thing called salvation and you really accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is then stamped on you to say that there is nothing that can pluck you out of the hand of Jesus from this point forward. The Holy Spirit is our seal. But but, but then if you're like me, you'll try to figure out, but what is the importance of the Holy Spirit in our lives? The Bible tells us that when the spirit of truth comes, the spirit of truth being the Holy Spirit, uh, he will guide you into all truth. There's an author, and her name is Penny no- Noise. I hope she forgives me if she receives this, if I mess up her last name. She summed it up this way, and I liked it. She said that through the power of the Holy Spirit, believers are saved, filled, sealed, and sanctified. The Holy Spirit reveals God's thoughts, teaches, and guides believers into all truth. The Holy Spirit also helps Christians in their weakness and intercedes for them. But that's what she said. But if we go back to the Bible, John the Baptist also says something. He said it in John chapter 14. 
verses 25 to 26, he said, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. This is Jesus speaking. So he says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. <laughs> Isn't it great? Aren't we blessed that Jesus is better than we are as teachers and parents? You ever be in school and learn a lesson and then you get homework and then you got to go home, right? And then you got to do the work and then you have questions, but your teacher's not there. So the only person you can rely on is your mom or your dad. And then they look at it and just be like, I don't, you didn't pay attention in class? Like, wait a minute. Yes, I paid attention in class. I just, I just need a little help. Like, can you help me to remember what I learned hours ago? And we struggle. But look at Jesus. Jesus said, hey, I've walked with you. I've taught you. I've told you many things. And because you're human and your humanity kicks in, I know you're going to forget some things. So I'm not going to leave you to struggle to try to remember. But I'm going to send you a counselor, the Holy Spirit, so that when you start going through life and you hit a rough patch, he can remind you of what I told you. Yeah. It's almost like the Holy Spirit is like a cheat code. To the test. Yeah. But yeah. Which means that any test we come up against, we actually shouldn't fail. Come on. Yes, sir. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Which means that if you're failing, it's a possibility that you're not tapping into your help. Come on here, somebody. Uh, okay, listen, let, let, me, let, let me help you, right? When, when the Holy Spirit is, is in your life, it's in the church, uh, the Holy Spirit moves. We see it in the scriptures that when they were in the upper room, that the Holy Spirit came and he said they could hear it. It was like a violent wind that came, which means the Holy Spirit, you can't see it. You might not be able to smell it. You may not be able to touch it, but you can actually sense it, which means that the Holy Spirit moves. So I want to share with you five ways that the Holy Spirit moves. Five signs of the Holy Spirit moving is what I want to show you. This list is not in totality. This is just five ways that you can identify that the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, in your church, at work, at home, in your car, period. All right? Here's number one. I don't want you to repeat after me. The lost are saved. Yeah, come on. The lost are saved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin and draws people to the Lord. So when the Holy Spirit starts moving, the lost begin to get saved. If you're saved today, it wasn't because you woke up one morning and said, ha, I want to be saved today. That didn't happen. There was something that happened to you in an encounter or over time that drew you to the Lord. And it was because the Holy Spirit was moving in your life. Whether somebody said something, you visited a church, or something happened, or you saw something, the Holy Spirit was moving. Because all of us were lost at some point. Some of us might still be lost. Yes, sir, but today is an opportunity for you to come on and get saved, right? Uh, uh, number two, right? Number two is that the sick are healed. Everybody repeat that to me. The sick are healed. Yeah, all right? Because God anointed Jesus. We see this in the Bible that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. And one of the results uh, of that was the healing of the sick, which we find in Acts chapter 10. Verse 38, right, which says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. 
and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. So when the Holy Spirit starts moving, the sick are healed. That's how we can see people and services come in one way and leave out different. Which means when we come in here, all of us should leave different. Amen, somebody. Number three, this is, this is a rough one because some people might get upset here, but repeat after me, Jesus is glorified. Period. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, Jesus is glorified. Right? Right? A true move of the Holy Spirit won't glorify anyone or anything besides Jesus, the Son of God. When the Holy Spirit starts moving, it will not glorify anyone or anything but Jesus which means that if the Holy Spirit is moving, if we think, and, and, and we start giving credit to man, that's not the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit starts moving, you can do nothing but, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. I surrender, Lord. Because when the Holy Spirit, the true Holy Spirit moves, not what we and man and flesh try to conjure up moments, but when the Holy Spirit truly moves and grabs a hold of us, all we can do is run to the altar and say, God, thank you for saving a wretch like me. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. The true move of the Holy Spirit. Number four. Holiness is increased. Holiness is increased. No believer is perfect. We all know that, right? Because we're not perfect. If you think you're perfect, you're not perfect. Sorry. No believer is perfect. When the Holy Spirit moves, God's children are called to higher levels of consecration. Secret sins, unforgiveness, worldly mindsets, all of that is challenged in the presence of the Holy Spirit. When a Holy Spirit moves, if you're tapped in, if you're a believer, you should never find yourself pointing the finger at somebody else. Because there's enough wrong in all of us to only worry about ourselves. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, it says, take the log out of your eye before you remove the speck in someone else's. See, when the Holy Spirit starts moving, the, yes, sir, the Holy Spirit is like a mirror. When he starts moving, you think, oh, look at all these people. And he says, uh-uh, look at yourself. Look about what you did last night. Look about this conversation. Remember when you was at the kitchen table talking about this person instead of helping them? Remember who you was in the bed with last night? Because you ain't married to them. Uh-oh. See, it's quiet. It's quiet. Because as believers, ain't none of us perfect. But it feels good to overlook our own flaws and point the finger because we don't have to deal with ourselves. But when the Holy Spirit moves, he makes sure he deals with us. That was number four, though, right? Let's move past that because I can tell you, we don't like that. Number five, <laughs> number five. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are stirred up. Yes, when the Holy Spirit moves, the gifts of the Spirit are stirred up. The Holy Spirit is the one who distributes the spiritual gifts. In a move of the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts are distributed and activated. We see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11. It says that it is the one and only Holy Spirit who distributes all these gifts. 
He alone decides which gift each person should have. That's why sometimes when the spirit gets heavy, you might find yourself doing something that you normally don't do on the norm. You might find yourself prophesying. You might find yourself speaking in tongues. because You might find yourself dancing in a, in a weird way. You might find yourself preaching. You might find yourself doing something because when the Holy Spirit starts moving, the gifts of the Spirit become stirred up. Well, here's the thing, right? All these things that we're learning about the Holy Spirit, some of it sounds good, some of it's tight. It's tight, but it's right, as they say. Somebody might be saying, I've never experienced those things. Somebody might be saying, I've been in church my whole life, and I've never experienced, Reggie, what, you, what you're saying. It's Okay. Because today we can make that change. Because the way for you to receive the Holy Spirit, or in order for you and I to receive the Holy Spirit, is that we must believe. Yeah. Come on, somebody say, we must believe. believe. Yeah, we must believe. Yeah. We must believe. Because I'm not talking about saying you believe, because there's a difference. I'm talking about really believing. Because it's one thing to say, hey, I believe. But do you? Because to really be a believer means that you have to be able to say to yourself and to have been convinced that I believe that Jesus walked this earth for me. I I believe that he had an opportunity to give up his call and his duty in the Garden of Gethsemane, but he didn't for me. I believe that he was betrayed for me. I believe that he was whipped with the cat of nine tails for me. I believe he had the crown of thorns put in his head for me. I believe that he was hung up on the cross and nails put in his hands and his feet for me. I believe he struggled there to breathe his own air for me. I believe he went to hell busted wide open for me, rose with all power and glory in his hand for me. I believe he rose on the third day, and if I was to ever try to go back to the grave, he's not there. He did all that for me, I believe. Yeah. I believe. And I serve you notice that if that's what you believe, then according to the Bible, in Romans, it says that if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that who's been risen from the dead, then you are saved. And then if you are saved, then it means that you have this promise of the Holy Spirit, which means that the same Holy Spirit that fell in the upper room now resides in you. It wasn't your conscience. It wasn't karma. It was the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that rested on Jesus rests on us. Yeah, because you believe. Now, here's the thing, and this this, is going to get a little tight again. Superheroes, when I was growing up, that was the thing. Everybody wanted to be a superhero because every superhero had what? Superpowers. And I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is a super person or anything because he had his spirit. But if we had to give the Holy Spirit like a superpower, I thought about it, I said, what would it be? And you know what it would be? Unity and oneness. But not unity and or oneness, but unity slash oneness, it's the same. Which is interesting. Because if the Holy Spirit superpower is unity and oneness, then the way that we know that the Holy Spirit is moving or is present in our life is that we will have and see unity and oneness. Let that sink in a little bit. 
This is how I know. Let's, let's go back to Acts. Let's go back to the scripture. Let's go back to Acts 2, verses 3 through 8 and 11, right? It says, verse 3 says, they saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews staying in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own tongue which means that they were in this room, they were all different nations, which means they were separated in the room. Which means that if they were coming from different places, then guess what? They look different, they talk different, they dress different, they walk different, they sing different, they praise different, they worship different. But what happened? The Holy Spirit fell, and then what happened? They all came together, and the Holy Spirit fell. Which means that the Holy Spirit is a unifier, not a segregator. Which means, which means, there should be, and grace me here, there should be no white church, black church, Asian church. You get where I'm going? There should be no Baptist is right, holiness is right, no apostolic is right, no Catholic is right. If we believe in the God that we read about and we read from the same Bible, and we receive the same Holy Spirit, which there's only one, then that means that we should be able to come together, praise and worship the same God in our own way, and nobody get upset. Because the Holy Spirit is a unifier, which means even though you speak another language, even though you praise different, I might shout, you might be a little bit more quieter. I might dance. You might just do a little two-step. I don't know. I might be loud. You might be quiet. I might run. You might not. Who cares? Because if we're doing it unto the Lord, we should be able to respect and love one another. Me and my brother and my sisters, it's five of us. We don't always agree. But let you disagree with one of us. <laughs> All five of us coming. Why? Because we're family. We blood. And like the old folks say, blood thicker than water. We ain't got to agree, but I'm going to protect then if you're saved, we're the same blood. So if the, yeah. Tommy, if the devil come after you, I'm coming after him. Because we blood. If the devil come after you, I'm coming after him. Because we blood. We blood, sis. We don't look the same, but we blood. If the devil come after me, guess what? Central better come after the devil. Because we're blood. We're family. Because if we're saved, the Holy Spirit has unified us into one body, one church. My body has a bunch of different members, 
but we all play for the same team, which is to make sure this body functions. If we're saved, why are we fighting against each other? I'm not jealous if you get to play bass, because I normally play bass. That's where you normally see me back here. I'm not jealous if another bass player plays. I'm glad, because then it gives me a chance to sit down here and worship with you guys. I'm not mad if somebody gets to sing a solo. I don't care if somebody gets to usher. I'm not jealous when Pastor Anthony's up here preaching. Because just like God is blessing you, he's blessing me. And as he's blessing me, he's blessing you. You know why? Because we're family. One spirit, one body, one church. I pray and hope that as the praise team comes up, we're going to sing this last song. And in the song, the, the chorus kind of says, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. And I pray that when we sing this song, that you will close your eyes and lean into it and have a conversation with the Holy Spirit. And really let the Holy Spirit fall right here on you. And if you're not a believer, I'm still going to ask you to join in. It might seem foreign, but if you've heard something today from the praise team, from this word, and you're saying, you know what, I want to make that step. I want to have that experience. Don't leave here without talking to someone so that we can help you to receive the Holy Spirit and to become a believer today. Hey, Central Online family. Thanks for watching Central's YouTube channel, but don't stop. I want to invite you to be part of our online community. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and then share it with friends. If you're blessed, go to our website, click on the give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Christ. We want to connect with you as well. So you can do that by filling out our connect card on our website under I'm new here. You can even plan your next visit here at Central. This way we can meet you in person. Thanks so much for watching. God bless.